All right. So we've talked about residuals and outliers and transformations in a kind of theoretical way. And now we actually want to do some of the code that goes along with that. I have this lab, which I put on Canvas about residuals, outliers, and transformations. And you can download it onto your computer. I'd recommend putting it into that same folder where you have your project in our studio so that it gets uh, saved with everything else. Um, and the first thing we need to do, of course, is to load some packages. I realized that I'm actually using a data set that's from a package that you might not have installed yet. So you might need to install dot packages. You could paste that down in the console without the comment. So just that part and you just need to run that once. So we're going to library tidyverse, library lock five data, and then the library stat two data. So the first thing that I want to do is uh, go back to the L-I-N-E conditions. Um, I think we've looked at plots before, but uh, maybe we haven't done them specifically in R yet. So the first thing that we want to do is create a linear model. I'm going to use the species area data set. Uh, and the way that we load that is data species area. And then you could control enter here. And then you get this data set. It's about um, islands and the area of the island and the number of species that live on that island. What I'd like you to do is to try to create a linear model that predicts the number of species on an island based on the island's area. So you could pause the video and try and make that model, uh, but then I'm just going to go on and do it. So I'm going to say m1 gets lm of, and then I want to think of what my response variable is. I'm trying to predict the number of species by that's the tilde again above the tab key, area, comma, data equals species area. And then I could control enter here. Now I've got my M1. And then we could look at the summary. So you could interpret those coefficients. They're really big numbers. Um, so as long as you named your model the same thing that I did, you can do this plot parentheses M1. Um, and I'm going to run this down in my console because that's the easiest way to do it. Plot M1. And when I hit enter, R is going to do this kind of weird prompt. R does this very infrequently where it does something kind of interactive, but for model diagnostic plots, it sort of will automatically show you a bunch of plots. So if I hit return, it will show me the residual versus fitted plot. Uh, and I think you can probably also already see that some conditions are violated. This does not look linear. I don't know even what to say about equality of variance. It's, it's a really weird plot. Um, and then if I'm in the console and I hit enter, it'll show me the second of the automatically generated residual plots. Here's a QQ plot. This also looks pretty weird and, and not good. Hit enter again, and this shows me the square root of the standardized residuals against the fitted values. So I talk about standardizing residuals in the lecture video, which should be before this on the playlist. Um, and this is a way for you to see, um, you know, kind of how big your residuals get. And again, if there's some relationship across the fitted values. And then if you hit return one more time, then it's going to give you your standardized residuals against your leverage. This is kind of uh, the Cook's distance plot. So again, I've got uh, my points. Um, they're, the numbers refer to the rows where uh, that observation is. Um, and R is always going to, on residual plots, call out the points that it thinks you're going to be the most interested in. So uh, the way that you read this plot is you look for these dotted uh, regions um, that are, you know, 0.5 and 1, and maybe it gets beyond 1 sometimes. I don't think I've ever seen that happen. And you look for, for points that are out there. Um, so we can see that point number 2 is sort of in between the 0.5 and the 1, and then point number 1 is way outside these bands. So, um, so it's basically, you know, it's got high leverage um, and, and then also it has a big standardized residual. So uh, that's what the Cook's distance area is telling you. In the console, you just hit enter to see each one of the plots. If you knit your document, um, all of those plots will be included. But a lot of times I um, do them sort of one by one. So let's step back and just think about the conditions. So we've got linearity, uh, which we could look at with a scatter plot. 
So again, I'd encourage you to pause the video and see if you can remember how to make a scatter plot of these two variables using ggplot. And then I'm gonna do it. So I'm gonna do a ggplot of species area plus a geom point, parentheses AES, and then my X is gonna be my predictor variable, which in this case is area, and my Y is gonna be species. Um, you could do Y first and then X. I don't know why X always occurs to me first. Um, and then I could control enter to see that scatter plot. So we can see that this looks not linear. It looks like a curved line would fit better. Um, so maybe that condition is violated. And then we could have also checked that using the first of those automatically generated residual plots. And the way that you just get one instead of all four is you do plot M1 comma, which equal one saying, I want the first one of those plots. So again, we've seen this one before. Um, and again, I think in the lecture, I told you what you want to watch for here. And no, I don't think that condition is upheld. Independence, you can't check it with plots. Normality, um, one way that you can check normality is with a QQ plot. That's the second of the automatically generated plots. So you would do M1 comma, which equal two, and you could control enter here. My friend and colleague, Sean Cross, has this uh, blog post where he talks about QQ plots and how to read them. Um, I think it's really good. So if you're struggling with that, um, I, I recommend going to look at it. Um, it has like some tweets in there that reassure you that even people with like PhDs in this stuff sometimes are like, how do you read the QQ plot? Is that skewed? Um, what's going on? And then another way to check the normality is with a histogram of the residuals. So we're kind of gonna fool ggplot a little bit. Um, ggplot likes to um, have a data set uh, and then um, find the residuals of a model. Oh, I think I was getting ahead of myself to my next example. Let's change that data set to species area. That's the one we want. So we're gonna say that we're making a a plot of that data set, but then what we're really going to do is use the residuals of M1 uh, to make a histogram. So if I control enter, it says pick a better bin width. So let's say bin width, width is equal to five or maybe seven. I don't know. It's pretty hard for me to tell from that if it is normally distributed or not. Oh, and I even gave you a spot to do it, but I made the data set name wrong. So I think that seven would be better. And no, I don't think the data looks very normal. Then we have the equality of variance. The way to check that is that first plot, the residual versus fitted plot. Do we think that that condition is upheld? Mm, I don't know, it's just so weird. Um, and then there's two more plots uh, that are the ones that I talked about at the sort of very end of the lecture about outliers um, and influence. Um, weirdly, they are plots three and five, which is the one with the Cook's distance. Um, plot M1, which equal four. That is another Cook's distance plot. Um, and you'll see this one, I think, well, I was gonna say with categorical data, um, but now I'm not sure. It's just another way to look at it. So it's got the observation number and then the um, the Cook's distance and, and big Cook's distance is obviously bad. So if our conditions aren't met, maybe we just don't use our model, but that's probably not what we want to do. So let's use a transformation of one or more of our variables until our residual plots look better. So I talked about Tukey's bulging rule in the videos. There's this thing of the ladder of powers, uh, which goes up, you know, y, y squared, y cubed. Um, it's got log of y in the middle, and then it's got like square root of y. Anyway, basically it's either raising something to the a power, um, but uh, there's also like the log part is sort of an exception in the middle. Basically, you just need to be able to use uh, the picture from Tukey's bulging rule, um, which uh, I uploaded to Canvas. I don't think that I actually have the file path quite right on my own computer, um, but let me go find it. So then the question is, which of these colored lines does this scatter plot most resemble? 
and I would say it resembles this green line. Um, so maybe we want to take the log of x, or maybe we want to raise y uh, to the second or third power. So we looked at this plot, and we think that it most resembles the green line. So we should take the log of x or raise y to the second power. All right, so we're going to try to add a transformed version of, uh, of one of our variables in this data set. And um, there's a bunch of syntax in this um, chunk of code. The place where we need to put in the tr transformation that we want is right here. So I'm just going to delete all this empty space. And then I'm going to say that my transformed version of my species, that's my y variable, is going to be species. And let's square it just to start. I'm going to read this code out loud to you, and then we'll talk through what it means. So species area gets, with the assignment operator, species area, then, that's how we pronounce this thing, mutate of transformed species equals species squared. So this set of characters right here, it's a percent sign and then a greater than sign and a percent sign. This is called the pipe. And we're going to see it um, more as we go through the course. It's a way to sort of poke data from one place into another. So I'm taking the species data and then I'm pushing it through into this pipeline. So into this mutate command. And mutate basically just means like kind of make it different. Um, and so in my mutate, I'm going to make the name of a new variable. Um, and I made this up. It could have been like my new variable or anything like that. I'm going to put it back to transform species um, just because. And I say that's going to be equal to, and then I'm saying I'm going to square the original species variable from my um, data set. So let's click the play button. We need to run both of those lines of code together. And then um, let's look at our scatter plot. So I've got um, my species area data in my ggplot, and then I'm going to use my y will be transformed species, and x will be area. So I'm going to control enter here. Does that look more linear? Uh, I don't know if it really does. Um, so let's see if we can add another transformation up here. So the way I would do that is put a comma, and then I usually hit enter. I'll do transformed uh, area. And that one we said maybe we should take the square root or uh, the log of area. So I'm going to run that code. And then if I go over here and look at my species area, now I've got new columns in my data set. That's what the mutate did, is it made these new columns. So instead of x equal area, I'm going to say x is equal to transformed, transformed area and control enter there. Ooh, that's looking more linear to me. So following Tukey's bulging rule, I think actually did help somewhat. Um, so let's make a model and look at our residual plots. So let's say M2 is equal to an LM where I'm going to try and predict the transformed species by the transformed area, and my data is still called species area. And I could look at the summary. I think I'm just going to start by saying plot M2 and look at those residual plots. So it says hit return to see the next plot, hit return. Ugh, that actually still does not look great. Um, Hit return, uh, that still doesn't look great. Okay, I don't know, we've got some pretty big standardized residuals. Ooh, we've still got some Cook's distance stuff going on. So maybe that's not the transformation that we need. Um, we could try, uh, just because um, statisticians love using log, we could try doing log of area. So I'll run this. Now my transformed area is the log of area. So I can just run this line here, M2, again, update that, and then plot the model plots. Oh, that's still bad. But the normal QQ plot is looking better. And standardized residuals, Cook's distance, maybe that's better. Even though this scatter plot looked like the green line on Tukey's uh, bulging rule, I'm going to actually take the log of species 
um, because I just love log that much. So let's control enter here. And then we could make our scatter plot again. That looks pretty good. Um, run our model again. Look at our residual plots again. Ooh, that's looking much better, right? We still have a wave in the line, but it's not like that crazy thing we had before. Those QQ plots look pretty good. Scale location. And now we've got nothing in those Cook's distance, those bad Cook's distance areas. So yeah, I think our transformation is better than the original. So again, this is more of an art than a science and statisticians love logs. So maybe your first move should just be to take the log. So just a little aside about the function log that takes the natural log, the one that's reversed by exponentiating something. If you wanted the log with base 10, um, the function is log 10. So uh, sometimes uh, the default log, like on a calculator would be log base 10, but the one in R defaults to the natural log. So I did a sentence interpretation in the lecture portion about logged uh, coefficients. And so we could use that to interpret the coefficients of summary of our M2. Let's see, the way it would work is I would say for a 1% increase, and again, because I logged my X variable, I'm going to say percent instead of one uh, unit, so a 1% increase in area, we would expect to see a 23.55% increase in the number of species. So and again, I'm just multiplying this by 100 in my mind um, to get that, that percentage.